Shalom, and welcome to the first episode of the Great Tribulation, Why Israel Will Be the Last Nation Standing. I'm your host, Marshall Masters publisher of Jesus and the Third Temple, and this 13-part series is made possible by Your Own World Books and features author Robert Ryland. Robert is an evangelical Zionist, and for him the real story of Judaism and Christianity begins in the sands of the Sinai during the days of Moses, and closes with an accurate historical view of the Temple Mount as it is today. His views will not be the ones you would expect to hear from the pulpit, apart from traditional teaching. This is because his book represents decades of impartial research. Robert followed the truth wherever it led him, and in the process deepened his own relationship with God and in ways he could have never imagined. In this series, he reveals the hidden mysteries of what really took place in Jerusalem during the days of Yeshua, and the laws by which he faithfully lived and died. Why is this knowledge important? Because to this day it remains an ancient and powerful force of history. Yes, the very one driving today's headlines as events unfold in the Middle East. This is why the goal of this series is to bring Christians and Jews together with a shared sense of history, purpose, and commitment to Messiah. For more information about Jesus and the Third Temple, the complete guide to the ancient history and secret rituals of the Red Heifer Ceremony, please visit yowbooks.com, Y-O-W-B-O-O-K-S dot com, or jesusandthethirdtemple.com. And now we begin with the first part of Episode 1. Why Israel Will Be the Last Nation Standing Well, Bob, I'm sure glad we have a chance to get this series going. I think we've got a lot of great information here, and beginning with doctrinal thinking versus what I call spiritual thinking. I'm sure you're familiar with doctrinal thinking. Veterinary. (laughs) <laughs> done that okay for me doctrinal thinking really is a reflection of status quo that's all somebody's decided that what they've got set up works and they don't see any point in fixing something that from their standpoint is not broken but that is not the path to truth the path to truth is one where you follow the truth wherever it leads and you forget about the political and economic sensitivities uh, with that in mind because this series really aimed at people who are seekers of truth like you. Up front, what are your opponent's chief criticisms of your book, Jesus and the Third Temple? Well, in the defense of some doctrinal thinker people, I uh, put forward the fact that it is human nature for many. I probably am an exception. Most people, if they've never heard it before, or if it's extra-biblical, They immediately uh, put up a red flag, a stop sign. Um, Also, there is a very subtle and lethal anti-Semitism that's exhibited here. Because some of them say, Ah, that's just Jewish stuff. I don't believe anything the Jews say. And that's one of the first things I ran into, by the way. Well, I can imagine that. Of course, that follows right after all the Jew jokes in Sunday, right? Exactly. But it did run into one fairly prominent TV evangelist. I balled, I balled him at a meeting and told him what I had found. And uh, he said that what I had was saying was the truth, in fact. But he would not stand up with me because there's another very real truth you have to consider here, and that is the peer confrontation. Oh, yeah. In fact, they kicked Hal Lindsey off the TBN network because he was too hard on the Muslims. Those people uh, make money by their sponsors, you know, 
We're all victims of each other. You know, I really understand that. The money gets involved. And next thing you know, you got guys with suits who really don't know how to make anything work, other than numbers, deciding what we're going to learn about. One of these doctrinal thinkers actually helped me. He showed me something that was wrong, but he didn't tell me why it was wrong. He just kept telling me it was wrong. And so I finally decided, well, well maybe he's right. So I'm going to go start digging and find out. By golly, I found out, sure enough, he was right. And it's an argument that the rabbis had, which we will probably talk about later in the series. But it's the very same confrontation. Mm -hmm. But I had to learn for myself. He doesn't know why I was wrong. He just knew I was wrong because he'd been taught otherwise. Okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you, on the flip side, did you get a warmer welcome amongst rabbis and Jewish scholars? Yes. Interesting. I have had a better reception among the Jewish people mm -hmm. and rabbis, uh, the few rabbis that I've talked with, than I have had from my fellow evangelicals, because uh, what I have is very radical to what they operate under. Like this friend of mine, he's an excellent scholar, and I highly respect him. Uh huh. But I was mistaken. And he told me about it, and he insisted on it. So I went and looked it up in my second favorite book, the Pentateuch and Half Torah. Mm -hmm. Not very many Christian evangelicals even know what it is. Right. But if you want to study the Torah, that is the book you must have. It was written by uh, Rabbi Hertz, and I got it at uh, Temple Israel, which is where I started my studies a local synagogue library. The ladies there uh, considered me the, the local Goy scholar. <laughs> <laughs> the local Goy scholar. In fact, they had me answer questions to people that called in once in a while. Now, I find that interesting because I do have a question. And I think it's very timely given current trends in America right now and what's happening in the Middle East. Because as the subtitle of this show goes, uh, Why Israel's the Last Nation Left Standing. Well, there are a lot of folks that are saying the United States is going to desert Israel. So the question then becomes, will America do that? Will it turn it back on Israel and walk away? It's very sad to say that they are right. They may have been reading the scriptures, the Old Testament. The best example I can think of is from Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. Verse 2 says that Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling to uh, all those round about. Now, this very something very subtle happens. Mm -hmm. The first one says to Jerusalem and round about. That's what's going on now. It's local. Mm -hmm. But then in the next verse, verse 3, it says what you ask me about. It says that Jerusalem will become a burdensome stone to all nations. And when they say all, they mean A-L-double-L, -L, underline three times, you know. Okay. Underline three times. I mean, well, you know, we're talking about making the point here. But on the flip side, you got folks that are out there saying that America will desert Israel. And as a consequence... Israel will no longer have funds for its military through American foreign aid, and that that will cause the end of the state of Israel. Now, you yourself, as an aeronautical engineer, you designed some of the aircraft that the Israelis fly right now. You're involved in those, particularly the F-16s and the F-15s. Right. The F-15s first saw combat with the Israeli Air Force. They were the first nation outside of the U.S. to get those aircraft, and, and it's an amazing airplane. I remember you'd sent me a video. One had its entire right wing sheared off and was able to make an emergency landing. Right. An amazing aircraft with amazing aerodynamics. So that, again, brings us back to the question, though. That is, Bob, Israel loses all the foreign aid. In that scenario, no differently than Iran was, after the Ayatollah came to power back in the 70s, is Israel going to face the same problem? Are they going to have a bunch of F-15s and F-16s that they can't get spare parts for that are going to be grounded, and therefore they're not going to be able to defend themselves? 
I don't believe that will happen for two reasons. First of all, historically, we know that God has always protected Israel when they are in his favor, Mm -hmm. which they apparently are now. And the other thing is, the Antichrist... Whoa, whoa, now let me go back to that. Go ahead. You just made a statement that Israel is in God's favor right now. Yeah. What prompted you to say that? Because uh, they have a lot of people are coming against them right now. Mm-hmm. Look what happened at Entebbe and a few other incidents. And uh, I am sure that they know exactly what's going on in uh, Iran, as far as the nukes are concerned. They're not going to wait for the United States or anyone else to protect them. They've learned this over a few thousand years that, hey, fellas, you better take care of yourself. Depend on God to help you as he always has. He brought us back to the land for the third time. That's very significant. The third time. Important number. Why is that an important number? Because that's God's number of holiness. There were three crosses at Golgotha. There were, Paul was stoned three times. He was shipwrecked three times. Threes go on and on. And we have the Holy Trinity in Christianity. Some Jewish people don't understand that. But three is God's number of holiness, and it appears throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Hmm. I wanted to tell you about another one, about the F-16. My buttons almost busted off my shirt. I heard an Israeli general say that without the F-16, they could never have pulled off that Iraq nuke raid. I remember that, yeah. The whole world said, oh my gosh, you went and did that. And then right. <laughs> secretly under the table, they were sending them love notes and saying, thank you. We were scared about that. Yeah. <laughs> but you've just stated that everyone's going to turn their back on Israel, including the United States. And I do not believe the people who are making that prediction are reading the Bible the way you're doing it. It more comes from the neo-Nazi sites that just hate Israel because it is a Jewish state, and they want to see it eradicated, and so they are licking their chops. The Muslims are unhappy. Why are they unhappy? Because of Israel. Well, the best way to uh, to solve a problem is to eliminate the problem. Hmm. Oh. oh, okay. That works unless you're the problem. But the other thing is, like I started to say, why I don't think they're going to starve to death and run out of parts, the United States is slowly being removed from its power status, and that is in order that the Antichrist, the man who appears in Daniel's prophecy, who's going to make a covenant to protect Israel, he is going to come to power and take over virtually the entire world. In fact, the Bible only says that Jordan will not come under his hand. And guess where Petra is? Jordan. Okay. And so we think that's where the Jewish refugees will hide out during his ravings and so forth and randings. But not far from the Dead Sea, as I recall. Yeah, exactly. But right, right during the first part of his seven-year covenant, he will support Israel. He's going to be their, their big brother. Boy, everything's going to be cool. Mm-hmm. In fact, in the Battle of Gog that it tells about in Ezekiel, we will go attack the unwalled villages. Well, that means that Israel would think that uh, everything is all right. They will be lulled into a state of complacency by this treaty that the bad guy made with them. And the other bad guys, the, the armies of Gog and Magog, they'll say, he's going to protect them. Guys, now is our time. So they go after Israel to take a spoil from unwalled villages. Well, and there will be a nuclear exchange, according to Ezekiel prophecy. Mm -hmm. The Gog, the rabbis have no doubt who Gog is, it's Russia, Mm -hmm. directly north of Jerusalem, and it's descended from horrible people back in the ancient times, the Scythians. And uh, it says there will be a nuclear exchange. In so many words, I will, I will bring a fire on thee, O Gog, and I will bring a fire on those who dwell carelessly in the isles. Well, the Western nations have waterfront property. 
Russia doesn't have very much. And so it says, in so many words to me anyway, that there will be a nuclear exchange. Okay. In the next segment, I really want to take a look at the series in general. But this is a key thought. We need a little more time on this. All right. To learn more about Jesus and the Third Temple by Robert Ryland, please visit JesusAndTheThirdTemple.com. And now we continue with the second part of Episode 1, Why Israel Will Be the Last Nation Standing. Well, Bob, I'd like to pick up on that thought about the nuclear exchange and Just out of curiosity, is there any indication in any of the information you have found, whether it's in the Bible or in any of the extra-biblical texts you use for your research, as to the nature of this exchange? Is it something where Israel nukes one of its neighbors, or is it a vice versa, or is there someone else that we haven't discussed? The scripture from Ezekiel doesn't imply in any way that Israel launches this exchange. It's between Gog and those who dwell carelessly in the isles. Okay. That's us and the Russians. So it's between Gog and those who come again? Those who dwell carelessly in the isles, or in the coastlands, some translations say. The Western world. The attack is going to come from Russia? Yeah. And who do you think they're going to be attacking? Us. The United States, Canada, Australia, the UK, anybody who in the Western world who has nukes. Okay. They're going to neutralize them because they would possibly come to the aid of Israel. And he wants to take credit for all that himself. He is who? Gog. Okay. And the uh, other nations, it names the other nations, Libya, Persia, Gomer, uh, and his bands, which is Southeastern Europe, Albania is 80% Muslim, for example, and Togarma of the North Quarters, and we think that's uh, Turkey. Mm -hmm. So then what you're saying is, and this really goes back to the first segment where we talked about the United States abandoning Israel, Mm. when in fact what you're saying now is it's going to just simply be taken out of the picture. We're not going to be in a position to help Israel or anyone else for that matter. We're Exactly. going to be dealing with the effects of a, of a very ugly nuclear war. We're going to be making socks for the Chinese. Mm. <laughs> That's one way to put it. <laughs> Previous to this battle, the rapture will have knocked the USA into severe chaos because of mysterious disappearances of many prominent Christians. This situation may tempt Gog to invade Israel. In all of this, how is Israel going to fare? Is Israel going to be attacked with nuclear weapons? Not at this time. This particular incident we're talking about, the Battle of Gog and Magog, Mm -hmm. is a battle between Russians and their allies, whom I named off, and those who dwell carelessly in the coastlands, which is all the free Western nations. And then uh, Israel will think, because they've had this covenant with the Antichrist, that he's going to protect them. And uh, they're not being watchful. They're very complacent. And so the bad guys in this situation come at them when they feel like they don't have to even be on guard. So Israel then gets lulled into a false peace. After that, the guacamole hits the fan. Three and a half years after that, covenant is made is one place where you could say the glacamole hits the fan because at that time the antichrist will commit the abomination of desolation at the place of worship that the israelis have set up because as soon as he signs the covenant with them they will begin temple worship again he will permit them temple worship at the extreme consternation to put it mildly of the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. But then, and after three and a half years, in the middle of the week in Daniel's prophecy, he will 
cause the sacrifices to cease, and he will turn against the Israelis. Like you said before, he'll make the Holocaust look like a Sunday school kindergarten ice cream picnic. They'll be hunting down Jews all over the world. Everybody will. Jews and newly converted Christians will be going along at the same time. They're in the last half of the Great Tribulation. And who's going to be hunting them exactly? The Antichrist and his people. He will be controlling virtually the whole world, everything except Jordan. Okay. A lot of going to be converted to Christianity during that time by 144,000 Jewish evangelists, 12,000 from each tribe. But the Antichrist, in the meantime, is going to be trying to kill off the Jews also. And anybody who won't sign up for his mark for loyalty will be separated from their head. It's very specific about that. That's not an interpretation. That Both the, the Christian and the Jewish teachers, the rabbis, say, it will be a time of trouble such as the world has never known or will never know again. In the Judaism, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And boy, it's trouble. A lot of this is from both books. Okay. Jesus was a Jew, so was Paul and the rest of them. Christians weren't invented until about the second or third century. <laughs> so from the Israeli perspective, I have a couple of questions. Uh -huh. One We've said Israel is the last nation left standing. But what about Jordan? Seems to kind of slip through the cracks here. That's one. And two is if Israel is the only nation left standing, how much of it is left standing? We don't know. But Jerusalem for sure, because that's where Messiah is going to operate from, and he is going to erect the temple that he will occupy. And there will be a remnant. God always preserves a remnant of his people. So the rest of the world will be in absolute turmoil, as we discussed earlier. And so I would say that Jerusalem itself will actually be the last man standing. I don't know about the rest of the nation. It's fairly agricultural, so I would think it would be virtually untouched, except for Tel Aviv, maybe. What happens to Russia? I'm going to bring a fire on the Ogog, so it's going to get nuked. It'll be pretty badly burned up and uh, flattened. Well, the earthquake that's coming is going to flatten every wall on Earth. So from the standpoint of us here in America, we're just going to be so miserable with our own situation. We're just going to be like most everyone else in the world, just watching from afar and getting scraps of information. but. That's about it. Exactly. Okay, so then these are really topical issues, and we've got a series of them, and I'm just going to read them off, and as I do, give me just a one-sentence thought that comes to mind. I've got pillar, fire, and cloud. Yeah, when did it leave the temple? Okay. He goats and scapegoats. The mysteries of the atonement ceremony with the goats. Okay, finding the temple site. That has been a huge contention between various people for years, and it's recently been found as far as I'm concerned. Okay, and secrets revealed? There are many secrets that are revealed in this book, and one of them is that I could take you to the place of the cross tomorrow. Wow, that one's going to be interesting. We then follow after that with Most Amazing Prophecy. The Most Amazing Prophecy is in Daniel 9, 24 to 26, where Daniel told the Jewish people when the Messiah would arrive in Jerusalem. And they were marking off their calendars, and sure enough, he arrived just exactly on the date that was calculated. And that's why they were throwing down their cloaks and the palm fronds in his path as Yeshua bar Yosef rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. That was the day. That was the day. All right. And then after that, we have Red Heifer Ceremony. That's the most unheard of, mysterious, and important temple ritual. We follow that with the Jewish Rapture. I thought that was an interesting title. 
out, I knew people would be intrigued by that. The righteous Jews are going to be taken up from their graves or from wherever they are, if they're alive, and translated to Jerusalem to meet Messiah when he comes. They're going to be taken 10 days before that, which is on the Feast of Trumpets. That's the next feast to be fulfilled on Rosh Hashanah. Ah, all right. And then we have Jewish Days and Nights. Yes. Uh, A lot of people have argued about the fact that Yeshua Bar Yosef was buried just before sundown on a Friday night. And then he was resurrected Sunday morning, right around dawn. Hey, I thought you said it was going to be three days and three nights. That's only about 36 hours. Not in Jewish way of counting. Ah, okay. And so then we have Messiah's first advent. Yes. When, when he was here the first time, he performed many miracles and said many things about what was going to happen later. And we'll be dwelling on those uh, as we get to the scenario of the, uh, of the time of the end. Okay. But he prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. And sure enough, 40 years later, it was. Okay, and then we follow that with the fire and the cloud. Well, the fire and the cloud was, uh, there. there's a lot more to that than what we talked about before. Uh, as I said, that's what started me out on this whole thing. I mean, uh, has anybody ever seen God? Well, no, but Moses first saw God in the form of this bush that was in flames, except it wasn't burning. Mm-hmm. And that was the Shekinah. And then later, God had Moses hide himself under a rock so he wouldn't be seen. And he talked to him and told him who he was. I am that I am. Moses, hey, who are you? You know. All right. Well. And he answered him. And when Moses came down from the mount, his face was flushed as if he'd been out in the sun too long. And that was from the, the brilliance of the Shekinah who was the visible divine presence. God also spoke to Moses, and he later on even spoke to the people. And one thing that some people get uh, upset about is that God spoke with a female voice. With a female voice. Now, we're going to have to get into that later on. But let's rock on here. We have the tribulation. The tribulation is the seven years of turmoil on earth which begins when Antichrist comes into power, and he's been after God. Let, so let me run the world. Oh, you want to run the world? Okay. You think we got bad storms and earthquakes now? Wait till this guy starts running the world, and things are going to go to pot fast. In every way possible that we can think of. Crime, wars. The Bible says, they shall say, peace, and there is no peace. There will be storms of magnitudes and frequency that we cannot imagine. In fact, we're seeing the onset of those now. Yes, we are. Jesus called this time the beginning of sorrows. When it does happen, they say, oh, well, it's always been that way. See, they won't remember how it was when you and I were nine years old. (laughs) They'll only remember how it is now. Oh, yeah, we've always had big earthquakes and tsunamis and the Not always. But finally, we have third and fourth temples. The third temple, people wonder about, uh, maybe that's going to be the next temple, because it says that the uh, Antichrist is going to commit the abomination of desolation by claiming that he is God, as if he were God, in the holy place. Well, one room of the temple is called the holy place. And so I think, and others think, that may be a coincidence that he just used those words. The uh, Muslims call all of Jerusalem Al-Quds, the holy place. Mm -hmm. And Theodosian said that the holy place was going to be the pinnacle of the temple, which is the southeastern corner of the temple wall from which James was thrown and martyred, uh, and where uh, Satan carried Yeshua to uh, offer him the whole world. He said, 
throw yourself down and a host of angels will rescue you and you'll prove that uh, you're who you are. Mm. And uh, Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But we don't know where that holy place is. But all the walls are going to be destroyed anyway. And so if they do build a temple, I don't think they'll build it next to the Dome of the Rock. It would start World War III right then. Besides the fact that the high rabbinical authorities would not permit building the temple with, even within sight of a heathen shrine, Christian or Muslim or anything else. Like they, when they came back from Babylon, mm -hmm. they used the tabernacle, and they can do that again. In that event, I think we've had a good look ahead at the series, and there's going to be a lot of information here. And what gave you the gumption to write a book knowing you were going to be branded a heretic? So hang with me. To learn more about Jesus and the Third Temple by Robert Ryland, please visit JesusAndTheThirdTemple.com. And now we continue with the third and final part of Episode 1, Why Israel Will Be the Last Nation Standing. Well, Bob, I think the listeners out there are going to be curious, a good part of them are going to be curious as to why you wrote this book, why you chose to follow a path that's, frankly, well off the beaten path of dogma and doctrine. So I'm going to pose the question straight at you. Why did you write this book? The thing that started me was my curiosity about the fire and the cloud. As I started writing, it became like a snowball, and I found all kinds of myths that I'd been taught. I wanted to tell other people about them if they were interested. Besides the fact that the more that I study the Talmud and Midrash and the, the Haftorah, I find that conservative Judaism mm -hmm. and conservative Christianity are very close in a lot of ways. The big argument is, who is that going to be whose feet stand on the Mount of Olives on that day. Mm -hmm. Other than that, they were very close in their teachings. Mm -hmm. And I had to write the book. I didn't plan on writing it. Like I say, it snowballed. Mm -hmm. I had to bring out these truths that I had found. Mm -hmm. Kind of addicted to that, as, as you pointed out. <laughs> <laughs> you sure are. How do you respond to those that would criticize you for using extra biblical material? They say that, for example, that, well, it doesn't uh, say anything about the removal of the glory of the Lord in the Bible. So that's for extra biblical. And so, so how can we believe that? Besides, that's written by Jews. And they almost spew the word out. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, well, where does it tell in the Bible that the temple was destroyed? That happened. And Jesus said it was going to happen. But it doesn't say it in Scripture. Mm -hmm. But this event was prophesied by Ezekiel, and it happened. And it was recorded by three or four historians that I know of. The mm -hmm. thing is, they've assumed that it happened before with Solomon's temple. There's no record of it, but they've just assumed that. And it probably did happen. In fact, we have a clue about that because of westernmost light of the candlestick, when it started not outlasting the other candlesticks. They said that was an indication that Shekinah was going to depart the temple. And so maybe that same sign happened before Solomon's temple was destroyed. But there is no historical record of the Shekinah departing the Solomon's temple. But it's detailed in enormous detail for the uh, Shekinah departing the second temple. Mm -hmm. And Josephus says that it was a public event. The whole city was told. All of Israel, all of Judah was told that it happened and when it happened and what it meant. They said, this is not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. If your God is leaving you, that is definitely not a good thing. Right. That would be a pretty tough thing to deal with. Which brings me to asking a question. 
of the relationships between Christians and Jews, because as you've noted, there's just a, an anti-Semitic bias that prevents many Christians from delving into this information. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems like both Christians and Jews got a lot of the same skin in the game, so to speak. So is there some way that your book and your efforts could help bring Jews and Christians closer? I believe that the spiritual thinkers among Judaism and Christianity will be brought closer. Mm -hmm. They will see the error of their anti-whatever ways, and they'll see these similarities that you mentioned. Uh, they both got dogs in the same fight. Mm -hmm. I think they will recognize that in these stories, because Jesus is Jew. Mm -hmm. Like I say, Paul, Peter, the rest of them, they were all Jews. When they were writing this stuff down, they weren't writing it down for Christian Bible to be called New Testament. Mm -hmm. They were writing down what they saw and what they knew. This takes me back to a visit I made to Israel with my wife back in 2000. And we were there the week after Pope Paul had been there for a visit. It was a huge visit. Oh, I bet. Jerusalem had really been decked out. It was a very good time for the merchants. A lot of people felt safe. They came in. But I remember standing in the square where he gave his speech, where he apologized to the Jewish people for thousands of years of anti-Semitism. And at the time, I remembered that there were a lot of Jews who were thankful for at least some recognition and others that felt he just hadn't gone far enough. <laughs> to really approach this division between Christians and Jews. How is it you can overcome it with this book? I mean, wouldn't someone be able to say, Bob, aren't you being a little naive? Well, they can accuse me of being naive, but everything that I've said in here, I got backed up with historical record and or especially scripture, archaeology, sometimes uh, including simple logic. But they have mostly tradition backing their opinion. Mm -hmm. Always done it that way. Right. Well, that may be, but you've been always doing it wrong. <laughs> I can't help that. But you know, there's an old saying in the computer business, if you're going to do it wrong, do it consistently wrong. Yeah, right. Well, they do. They do. I understand that. So, yeah, this is going to be definitely a challenge. But let's get to a more practical reason why Jews and Christians should be closer than what we would find in the Bible. I mean, there's definitely a clear message there, but let's boil this down to a survival context. Right. Because you're saying that we're, we have nuclear wars, we have earthquakes beyond imagining, we have a pole shift. I mean, it's rock and roll time. And also at this time, you've also said that Jews are going to be hunted out all over the world and slaughtered. Yeah. So is it something where, for Christians, it would be easy to look the other way while the Jews are being loaded up on the carts like they were in uh, Nazi Germany? Well, the Christians aren't going to have it very soft either. Okay. They're going to be hunted down the same as the Jews and uh, executed by removal of the head. All right. But the very practical reason for Jews and Christians coming together, especially at this time, is the threat of Islam. Right. They have made it very clear in the Quran. I've made considerable study of the Quran mm -hmm. that we are to be either converted or annihilated by whatever means it takes. Just doesn't say that in one place either. <laughs> you know what? My message to Islam is. May all your black-eyed virgins in paradise have chronic yeast infections. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the next topic here, because this is really okay. We've got a practical reason. We've both got our heads on the block. We're both getting our tuchus kick, Christians and Jews alike. But there's got to be a little edge. And so uh, you mentioned earlier that Jews have always been victorious in early battles. Could that Old Testament luck come back to help Israel one more time? It could, although in a different way. 
The, what I referred to was the miracle of the Jews and the afad that the high priest wore. He had 12 jewels on there. And uh, during the time of Saul and uh, David, those jewels would glow if they were going to be victorious over the enemy. They would stand up and ask God in prayer to give them uh, an answer. And if the jewels glowed and twinkled, they, he's saying, go get them, guys. Or if the jewels just sat there and there was nothing, we don't want to go there. <laughs> and Saul, he just kind of sloughed it off later. He, he lost his faith in the Ephod sign, and he just didn't pay much attention to it. But then when King David ascended, he used it all the time. That's why he was so successful in battle all the time. He had the help of the Lord standing behind him. He didn't have the priest with the jewels there when he was facing the giant, Goliath. But later on in his battles, where people were saying that David kills 10,000s, where Saul kills thousands, he was tremendously successful. But kings later on hardly used it at all. All right, one last question for this show. If Christians out there decide to follow a path similar to yours, where they're just following the truth where it leads them, and they're in the process of that going to see that it is to their advantage to find closer bridges between Jews and Christians, are they going to benefit from the fact that the Jews do have this history, as you just pointed out, with David? Would that apply today? Are they going to have that same advantage today as they would with the rule of David? I don't know if the Jews are going to have that kind of battle success, but we already discussed the miracle of a sort that's going to occur at the Battle of Gog and Magog. Maybe you didn't catch it, but God is going to destroy five-sixths of that invading army. And the Jews are going to have to have a lot of red heifer ashes in order to purify all the graves from having buried all those people. Wow. And purify the people that bury them. Mm. They're going to have to have a lot of red heifers. Trust me. Wow. So that's a miracle uh, of sorts uh, that's already predicted. All right. But I wish I could find other Christians that have my same bent on this. because. I have found that studying the Talmud and the Midrash and other Judaica has made me a, a stronger Christian. I've looked for Christianity, Messiah, and other strengths and stories of God, the Father, in the Talmud and the Midrash and, and so forth, strengthened me, things I never expected to find. Oh, another great book source is the Jewish Book of Why. Okay and the second Jewish book of why. So these are sources that you've used, and you found knowledge, you found strength, and you found your own faith reinforced. And I think that is pretty interesting, which brings us to a wrap on this. But when we pick it up with Pillar, Fire, and Cloud, our next episode, I really am interested in finding out what got the burr under your saddle to get all of this started for yourself many years ago. Okay? Okay. This concludes Episode 1, Why Israel Will Be the Last Nation Standing. Next up is Episode 2 of the Great Tribulation, Pillar, Fire, and Cloud. To learn more about Jesus and the Third Temple by Robert Ryland, please visit JesusAndTheThirdTemple.com. Music